Welcome. CitizenU.org presents The Twelve. We're the two teachers. And we will be deliberating to help you cram for your exam, the AP government exam, in 12 sessions. Today's finding, essential court cases. Oh, got a no court cases. K-N-O-W. Andy, on this AP government exam, they've told us we need to know court cases. The good news, though, is we need to know 12. 15 cases. Oh, watch yourself. 15 cases. Let's go one at a time. So, yes, we now know it's very transparent what 15 cases there are. But within those 15 cases, there's some crucial content you should know. We should know how those cases relate to some of the founding documents you're going to be asked to understand. And we can even preview some other relevant cases. These are cases you don't necessarily have to know. But we know that in the free response question about the essential court cases, they're going to link our essential cases to a case that isn't necessarily on, that will not be on this list. So, Andy, you should know the context of these cases. Hey, let's start. Marbury v. Madison. Judicial review. Judicial review. Andy, this is in that area of how strong should the national government be in this case, in relationships to the other branches. This is checks and balances. We know that this was addressed in Federalist Papers 78, where they described the court as the least dangerous branch, but they also previewed the idea that the court should have the power to determine if a law was constitutional or not, which is interesting because the, the concept of judicial review is not addressed in the U.S. Constitution, but it is in the case Marbury versus Madison. And it had to do with the nomination of judges and other executive branch individuals. And Andy, in this case, they ruled the Judiciary Act unconstitutional. And this also relates to the idea of checks and balances and separation of powers, something we see in Federalist 51. A, A great example of that is a Supreme Court case that's not on our essential list, but that's U.S. v. Nixon mm. from the Watergate scandal, where the Supreme Court told the Nixon administration they had to hand over the White House tapes as part of the criminal proceedings into the Nixon White House. Marbury v. Madison, Judicial Review. Andy, let's go to McCullough oh. v. Maryland. This, to me, sounds like national supremacy. National supremacy, part of Article Six in the U.S. Constitution, the Supremacy Clause. The idea that when there's a conflict between national law, what we call federal law, versus state law, the national law is almost always going to win. So this is a federalism case, Annie. At issue was the state of Maryland, Baltimore, who sought in their wisdom to tax the United States. The national bank could be a source of local revenue. And the Supreme Court said, not going to do it. Right. And this also connects to some of those Supreme Court cases shortly after that expand the economic power of our national government and Congress One of the most famous is Gibbons versus Ogden, the idea that the interstate commerce power of Congress can be a flexible entity. It doesn't have to be specifically spelled out in the Constitution, and it granted our Congress, our national government, more power to regulate the economy. McCullough v. Maryland, national supremacy. Andy, U.S. v. Lopez. Well, that's the opposite, right? Federalism. We know that over the course of 200 years, uh, the national powers to regulate the economy with the Interstate Commerce Clause, mm, Commerce Clause. had greatly expanded. We know that Congress, in fact, uh, desegregated uh, public facilities with its power to regulate commerce with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That expansion of national power really you see the boundaries that comes to an end with U.S. v. Lopez. A little devolution here, folks, where the Supreme Court took sides with a conservative issue. Has the national government grown too large? Have they used the Commerce Clause too much? And in U.S. v. Lopez, a gun issue dealing with a federal statute uh, regulating gun sales within uh, school zones. And the Supreme Court said yes. It was unconstitutional. The national government had stepped too far in its usage of the Commerce Clause. And shortly after, you have another Supreme Court case, U.S. versus Morrison, where the majority of the court again said there are limits to the expansion of using the Commerce Clause. In that case, uh, in U.S. v. Morrison, the Supreme Court invalidated parts of the Violence Against Women Act. U.S. v. Lopez, limiting the national government's use of the Commerce Clause, federalism. 
Let's look at Ingle v. Vitale. Finally, a civil liberty, First Amendment, Establishment Clause. Remember, the Establishment Clause limits the national government from showing preference to one religion over another. Ingle v. Vitale, dealing with prayer. Sometimes we describe this as, as the wall of separation between church and state, or, or the division between religion and government. We know that government is not supposed to promote or block religion, Engel versus Vital is a good example of that. Engel v. Vital is about prayer in public schools, and the Supreme Court said no. Prayer in public school is a violation of the establishment. Careful, Dan. It's if the public school is requiring the prayer, it's a violation of the establishment clause. Students can pray, teachers can pray on their own, but if it's actually the government requiring the prayer, that's where the government is promoting religion. And in the case of Engel versus Vital, uh, you see the court putting a limit on that government action. Ingel Vital Establishment Clause, wall of separation between church and state. Let's look at a case, Andy, that seemingly invited free exercise of religion, another First Amendment issue, Wisconsin v. Yoder. Right. The, the right to free exercise of religion is the right to practice your religion. In, in the 1970s, the state of Wisconsin had a state law that said that all students had to go to public high school to, to the age of 16. And a group of Amish residents of the state of Wisconsin said, we don't want to send our students to a public school that goes against our religious beliefs, or against our religious practices. And the Supreme Court agreed with the Amish family. So, Andy, here's a case where the government's actually saying yes, but many of our free exercise cases might actually be no, like in uh, Oregon v. Smith, where uh, two Native Americans uh, exercising their what they thought was their religious freedom to smoke peyote, and the Supreme Court said, no, the, your, your employment could restrict that. Uh, because it violated certain social norms at the time. Right. So free exercise doesn't mean you can do anything you want and call it religion. The Supreme Court will decide, and this is where these cases are so interesting. But in the Yoder case, the Supreme Court did side on the, on the yes. side of religious practice. Let's look at a First Amendment free speech case, Andy. One of the early ones, yeah. Shank versus the United States. So this is a famous case in that you had a, essentially an opponent to the world World War I and the draft. Uh, he was prosecuted under an Espionage Act from the national government. The question was, was the national government violating his right to free speech because they were punishing his speech against the draft? Don't mistake this for a state case. We haven't incorporated the Bill of Rights yet, but in Schenck versus well, the United States... We haven't incorporated the Bill of Rights as of Schenck. We haven't incorporated the free speech in terms of Schenck. Remember, this is that case where we hear that line that we've heard so many times, don't yell fire in a crowded movie theater. Don't, don't falsely yell fire. If, if there's a fire in your theater, you can yell fire. Well, now fire. we're just getting don't, picky. That's not picky. But don't in, falsely in, yell in fire this in a case, theater. we see the United States government limiting speech. Absolutely. Clear and present danger. This is where the Supreme Court rules that if speech is going to harm national security, if it's going to cause a clear and present danger... To national security, the government can punish speech. And in that case, the Supreme Court allowed the national government to punish Shank's speech. Hey, let's look at Tinker v. Des Moines. This is a fun case because it deals with us, kids and teachers in school. Tinker v. Des Moines, the infamous black armband case. Speech in school, Andy? Protected the same? Well, in Tinker v. Des Moines, the student's speech was protected. Uh, this was a critical case where the Supreme Court said students and teachers do have some constitutional rights in their public school, in this case, to use symbolic speech, black armbands, even though it was offensive to some at the time and, and caused uh, possibly a disruption. The oh, Supreme it better Court, not cause a disruption. Well, in this case, the Supreme Court said that the students' speech, the black armbands, was protected. It's a complicated case because Public school students these days know that administrators have a, a, a lot more power to restrict student speech. From cases like Morris versus Frederick or Bethel versus Frazier, we know that public school administrators, if they label speech as disruptive to the educational mission of the school, 
that that speech can be prohibited and sometimes punished. Tinker versus Des Moines, a symbolic speech. Students have not lost their liberties at the schoolhouse gate. How encouraging. And, and we can probably add that this is an example of the Supreme Court incorporating the First Amendment right to free speech because it applied the right to free speech to a local government. Hey, let's look at another free speech case, New York Times versus the United States. Can the U.S. government limit the press? Yeah, this is called a prior restraints case. The idea that can the government, before the publication of news or information, can the government restrain that publication, restrain that speech prior to the publication? In this case, the Supreme Court said no. Even though the New York Times and Washington Post had top secret information that, national had, been, security that at had been stake? leaked to them and that the Nixon administration said national security was at stake. Oh, the old Pentagon Papers. The Supreme Court said that in this specific case, the government did not have the right to restrain that speech. So New York Times versus the United States, free press, national security can be used by the government to limit press. In this case, the Pentagon Papers, the Supreme Court said, run the presses. And we can add that a really similar case to this is Near versus Minnesota, yes. where the state of Minnesota was deemed to be trying to use prior restraint. And that case was from the 1930s. But again, an example of where the right to free press from the First Amendment was incorporated and applied to state government. And here's a case we hear a lot of buzz about, Citizens United versus -E FEC. So complicated. FEC. Let's, sim let's simplify it. So this is another First Amendment free speech case involving political campaign donations. Wait, I thought campaign money was covered by the First Amendment. Well, now you're hinting back to a previous campaign finance case, Buckley versus Vallejo, which is really mm. the, the, the grandfather of campaign free speech cases. The court in Buckley versus Vallejo said, yes, the federal government can limit our individual contributions that are made directly to candidates. Students might remember that as hard money. But... Citizens United versus FEC is different. This is the idea that now a corporation or a labor union mm. is giving an unlimited amount of money to an independent group. Soft it's not, money. It's not directly to a candidate, but it's to an, an issue idea or to an organization that's separate from a campaign. And the Supreme Court said that's protected free speech, that you can give a corporation or labor union can give an unlimited amount of money to independent expenditure groups, and that that was protected free speech. So Citizens United, sounds Citizens United sounds like a campaign case, but it's really a First Amendment case, allowing individuals and corporations, which the court thinks is the same. Hey, let's look at another interesting case, McDonald v. Chicago. Chicago. This is a 2010 case involving the Second Amendment right to bear arms. It's probably our most recent case where the Supreme Court incorporated one of the liberties from the Bill of Rights. You remember, applying a Bill of Rights clause to the states is called incorporation. And Andy, you're right, McDonald is the last time the court has done this. And it's the first time they applied the Second Amendment. Boy, just in 2010, so recent. So before McDonald, each state, each local municipality could essentially write their own gun laws, but now it's universally applied in McDonald, universally applying the Heller precedent, which defined what the Second Amendment is. And we should probably add that, remember that selective incorporation is done through the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. So McDonald v. Chicago, applying the Second Amendment to the states, allowing for each citizen the right to own a gun. Andy, let's look at another incorporation case, one of my favorites, Gideon v. Wainwright, incorporating the Sixth Amendment's right to counsel, to lawyers, to attorneys. Remember, we, we have a number of protected criminal civil liberties in the Bill of Rights. Those civil liberty protections really didn't extend to us at the state or local level until the 1960s. What? Well, again, the Bill of Rights originally only applied to the national government. It's with incorporation, the use of the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, that on a case-by-case -case basis, the Supreme Court extends those liberties. 
in Gideon versus Wainwright that liberty was the Sixth Amendment right to an attorney. So when I see Gideon, I think my right to an attorney. Boy, we have not uh, shunned controversy. Let's look at another one. Well, Roe v. Wade. Just, just going back to Gideon real quick, a real classic we example of that incorporation is Unanimous. Matt, Matt versus Ohio, in which the Supreme Court incorporated the Fourth Amendment exclusionary rule to apply to evidence that had been seized unreasonably in violation of the Fourth Amendment to state and local trials. I think you just don't want to talk about Roe v. Wade, but let's go. We're stepping in. Roe v. Wade, another arguably arguably a, an incorporation case dealing with the right to privacy. Hmm, Andy, right to privacy. Where do we find that in the Constitution? Well, this is one of the big controversies of Roe v. Wade because the right to privacy is inferred in parts of the Constitution and parts of the Bill of Rights. You mean it's not explicit? No, this is implied. Mm, the Supreme Court and the majorities have said that it's implied. The right to privacy really starts with a, a with a case prior to Roe v. Wade yes. called Griswold versus Connecticut. Mm, substantive was, due process. It was a case about access to birth control. But that's where the Supreme Court develops this right to privacy, and it's extended to the right to, for a woman to have an abortion procedure in the case of Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade, right to privacy, the context is a woman's right to choose an abortion, now applicable in all 50 states, incorporation. Right. And you would see a similar case of Planned Parenthood versus Casey, oh, yes. where the Supreme Court reaffirmed its founding in, in Roe v. Wade. And even the same-sex marriage case from 2015, Obergefell versus Hodges, where the Supreme Court said that uh, the right to same-sex marriage was protected by the 14th Amendment's due process clause. Andy, we can't avoid it any longer. The granddaddy of them all, one of the most recognized cases in our history, Brown v. Board of Education, the clarion call by the federal government on civil rights. Such a great example of what we call a landmark case. This is a case Brown versus Board of Education, that overturned a Supreme Court precedent. Plessy v. Ferguson. Plessy v. Ferguson. Remember, Plessy v. Ferguson from the 1890s established that you could have public facilities that were separate but equal, and it sets up this era of Jim Crow laws in public facilities and in public schools, but the public school component of racial segregation was overturned with Brown v. Board of Education. And Brown v. Board of Education really using that 14th Amendment idea of equal, equal protection. protection just enlivens the civil rights movement and allows the Supreme Court to really be the opening salvo in that civil rights movement. The first successes for our civil rights movement in the 1950s were found in the judicial branch, Brown v. Board, separate is not equal. And we certainly know that that creates tremendous momentum behind the civil rights social movement, uh, leading to Dr. King's protest in Birmingham against the Jim Crow segregation laws in letter, Birmingham, Alabama. Mm, letter from a letter Birmingham, from a Birmingham jail. jail articulates the effort to uh, use nonviolence to fight against the violent tactics of the segregationists. You know, interesting, Andy, Earl Warren, who shepherded the unanimous opinion in Brown, was asked late in his career, what was the most important case you ever participated in? And he said, Baker v. Carr. Mm. Baker v. Carr, one man, one vote, the most important? Hmm. Sounds to me like the Supreme Court got involved in the political thicket. Well, this is the reality. It's really, it's about math and how math can lead to more equality and civil rights as long as that math is equal. Because before Baker v. Carr, it was very common in both northern states and southern states that state legislatures would draw legislative districts with unequal populations between Mal urban areas and rural areas, which really worked to the disadvantage of, of racial and ethnic minority representation. With Baker v. Carr and then later in a case called Wesbury v. Sanders, mm, yes. the Supreme Court says that that type of mal malapportionment using unequal uh, populations in different legislative districts in the same state was unconstitutional and violated the Equal Protection Clause. So ultimately, our democracy can only be healthy when our representation is equal. 
that everyone's vote is counted as the same. Baker v. Carr opened up that enterprise, that journey our Supreme Court has been on and is still on to get involved in the political debates of our two parties and state legislatures. Andy, one more case. Well, this one relates to Baker v. Carr. Shaw v. Reno. It is. Racial gerrymandering. So this is the idea that after the Voting Rights Act of 1965, some states went to the to the means of drawing congressional districts, legis legislative districts, that had a majority of racial minority voters. And this specific district in North Carolina was a question, did it violate the 14th Amendment? Well, not unlike affirmative action debates, Andy, Shaw v. Reno suggests that although race cannot be the only factor, it can be used yes. in drawing congressional district lines so as not to dilute the power and authority of racial communities. And it's really the decisions in Baker v. Carr and Wesbury v. Sanders and Shaw v. Reno that are some of the big reasons why congressional districts are drawn the way they are now and one of the reasons why the House of Representatives is a more racially and ethnic diverse chamber than the U.S. Senate. Andy, I'm so thrilled to announce that on the AP government test, no court cases. What? K-N-O-W, uh, no court cases. We're the two teachers, no fancy words. No fancy suits. Plain talk about issues you need to know. Just in time. 